right. Thank you very much for the um, possibility to um, present my research here. That's quite old research, but uh, nevertheless, I'd like to come back to it. And I wish such a conference had taken place when I was writing my PhD, because then um, I would have had more ideas for um, that what I was writing. Okay, the analysis of Renaissance student manuscript codices is an important research field as this conference shows. In my dissertation, I use this form of material text culture to trace the reception of the intellectual movement of Renaissance humanism at the University of Ingolstadt in the end of the 15th century. For those of you who are not familiar with the geography of Bavaria, I marked uh, Ingolstadt in this map of the late medieval um, university landscape, so you have some idea where we um, about the place I am talking about. The short paper concentrates on a specific aspect of this project, i.e. on the manuscripts late medieval students in the southeast of the Holy Roman Empire used to store, retrieve and transport knowledge taught and learned at the University of Ingolstadt. In this case study, I will present some ideas how these notes in the student manuscripts can be analyzed. And I want especially to discuss some aspects um, of the relation of form and concept um, um, concerning this student manuscripts. The reading and commenting of authoritative texts to a student audience was the central characteristic of the lecture, arguably the most important format of teaching at the late medieval or the, at the medieval universities. The possession of a copy of the text lecture was important for all students, as knowledge taught and explained during the lecture was easier to understand or to follow when the text was available in front of them. Furthermore, the copy enabled the owner to add notes um, to the main text, thus securing the comments and explanations given by the master during the lecture. Getting a copy of the book read during lectures was therefore an important um, thing for university students in the later middle ages. During the 14th and the 15th century, several options for getting the relevant textbooks existed. As university and faculty libraries were not open to students, but the access was exclusive for the teaching staff, they were not to place to get a hold of the books for the students. While in Italy, the Petia system reduced the costs of the books because professional scribes copied these section-wise. In the empire north of the Alps, such professionalization in the book production was unknown. At the universities in the empire, other strategies were used in the 15th century before the success of printing provided enough cheap copies for a university audience. One of these strategies is already depicted in the famous uh, miniature of um, Henricus de Alemania lecture. At the far end of the second row here, Two students share a codex while listening to the master's explanations. This was a common practice as, regulation in as regulations in university and faculty statutes show. The arts faculty in Ingolstadt, for example, decreed in summer 1476 that not more than three students should use one copy of a text during a lecture together, and thus limiting um, bigger groups of students using one book. At the same time, however, the Council of the Arts Faculty in Ingolstadt created a possibility for the students to acquire the text commented in the lectures. The faculty paid two masters who dictated the textbook used in the following semesters before the lectures started during the summer break, for example. Thus, the students could write down the text beforehand and then use them during the lectures or after the lectures um, to um, make use of their notes. And the second half of the 15th century paper was available as a relatively inexpensive writing support. Therefore, this was a rather affordable yet work intensive way to get copies of the text read in the lectures. Now we turn to the uh, student manuscripts. But beforehand, I want to um, 
explain something on the text I was especially looking at. And these is or these are the Eleganzule, uh, written by the Italian humanist Augustino Status. Um, this book offers an introduction to classical Latin grammar and style. The work was very popular, was a very popular textbook in rhetoric classes at universities in the empire during the second half of the 15th century. This book, originally written for the youth in schools in Italy, explains the subject on a very basic level and offers a wide range of illustrative examples for Latin grammar and style. Therefore, I saw the number of copies written for and used in Ingolstadt rhetoric lectures as an indicator of rising master and student interest in the educational ideas of Renaissance humanism. Also, this is on a very basic level. I was able to identify 20 manuscript copies of the Eleganzule that were written or used by Ingolstadt students from the late 1470s to the 1490s. These manuscripts allow us um, to assess the extent of intellectual changes in university teaching as they show, as they actually show which books were um, copied, used and deemed as worth preserving by the students. A code that's um, held today at the Staats- and Stadtbibliothek Augsburg shows which way the student manuscripts could take. Konrad Hess copied the text of the Eleganzule in the 1470s while studying at the Arts Faculty in Vienna. A short entry at the beginning of his codex tells the name of the scribe and his location. Here you have Konradus Hess, ex no novo foro, baccalarius, Studii Vienensis. In 1481, Konrad Hess left Vienna and continued his studies at the University of Ingolstadt. Apparently, the copy of the Eleganzule was no longer of use for him there, and he sold it to Johannes Stedmeister, another Ingolstadt student. The manuscript um, contains glosses written by two hands, one belonging to Konrad Hess and the other one to Johannes Stedmeister, who repeatedly refers to himself in the glosses he added to the text. As we learn from official university documents, for example, from the documentation of the bachelor exams in 1479, Johannes Stedmeister stood at the very end of the university's hierarchy. He held, for example, the last position at the solemn act of the bachelor promotion in autumn 1479, and that was not an expression of his poor academic achievement, but of his limited social and economic possibilities within the um, personal network of the late medieval university. Under such circumstances, a used textbook textbook copy, both from another student, is, in my opinion, not a surprise, but illustrates how students found cheap ways to get to the relevant texts. The manuscripts of the Eleganzio allow us to get allow us to get some ideas on what happened in the late medieval lectures in Ingolstadt. The layout of the textbook is representative for late medieval university manuscripts. In the student copies, the main text of the Eleganzule is written in bigger script. You see here the thicker and bigger writing um, is the main text. Additionally, there is room for notes between the lines and at the margins of the pages. Glosses inserted between the lines mainly explain the meaning of single words, give synonyms, and name grammatical phenomena. They were probably dictated by the master in the lecture and written down by the students. The Ingolstadt student Johannes Garmont, for example, noted in a marginal gloss of his copy, Hic Master Asignat, Hic uh, Magister Asignat. Similar references can be found in many other manuscripts. Um, I give you a short, short examples. For example, Ostended Magister Ornatum, Ponet Magister Distinctionem, Ponet Magister Preceptum. Furthermore, Ramuk wrote in, a, wrote in an interlinear gloss above the name of the classical Roman author Terentius, 
in very poor Latin, a short information, it is poeta. Um, and similarly, other students wrote about um, Cicero il poeta um, or other explanations. And now we zoom in in a special um, section of the Eleganzule. This section of the Eleganzule copied and annotated by an anonymous Ingolstadt student who later became a monk in the Regensburg Monastery of St. Amaran explains the correct use of the Latin particulates multo, which translates into much, and longo, which translates into far, with a comparative of adjective. The textbook section reads, and I give you an English translation on comparatives. Multo and longe are usually put before comparatives. For example, justice is much more magnificent than the other virtues, or Socrates is far wiser than the other philosophers. Between the lines, the grammatical explanation hoc ad verbum, this is an adverb, is given above the words multo and longe. The synonym valde is noted above multo. The name Socrates mentioned in the main text apparently required the explanation the philosophers, he is a philosopher. Above virtutibus, you find temperantia and modestia as explanation for other um, virtues um, than justitia. This explanation, I'm sorry, these notes are short, comprise often only one or two words, and they represent basic explanation of the Latin text given by the master. These explanations help the students to understand the actual meaning of the text and provided more information. This was very basic language education given in Ingolstadt rhetoric lectures. As the medieval university had hardly any entry requirements, basic knowledge and skills had to be taught in these courses, which stood at the very beginning of the study program at the arts faculty. The glosses at the margin of the manuscript pages, however, show more engagement with and a deeper understanding of the main text. They contain no grammatical or lexical explanation, but more examples for the correct use of the grammatical and stylistic rules are given here. The anonymous um, glossator of the St. Amaran Codex at first wrote down a rather simple example in his marginal class, and this is um, hardly readable, and it says Johannes Longe Doctora as Petro, Johannes is far more learned than Peter. Then more elaborate, elaborated examples follow with Vinum Multo Preclarius as Cervisia, wine is much more magnificent than beer, and Studium Ingolstadtense as multo vigorosius lepsense. The University of Ingolstadt is far more powerful than the University of Leipzig. With alcoholic beverages and inter-university rivalry, examples from the students and masters daily life were used as a didactic concept in foreign language teaching. And this might really, uh, relate to our forms of foreign language teaching. So, in his copy um, of the Eleganzielle, Johannes Stegmeister added in a marginal gloss next to the very same um, section we were discussing um, already. Johannes Stegmeister is far more popular with the girls than the other bachelors. It seems unlikely that the master, that the Ingolstadt master, had dictated this particular example for the stylistic rule. Apparently, Johannes completely understood the matter taught in the lecture and was able to actively formulate a Latin sentence that's referred to his everyday life. The correct use of the ablative of comparison is also a distinct feature of this gloss. In medieval Latin, a construction with a particular quam would have been common practice. Um, and the scribe of the um, 
St. Amber manuscript we were discussing before actually notes this clarification in his interlinear gloss, Socrates longe sapientur est quam alii philosophy, because um, he had to explain the ablative of comparison. I summarize the relations of format and content in the student manuscripts. There are three different parts recognizable in the manuscript pages. They differ in size of the script and in positioning. The, origi the original text of the Eleganzule is written in bigger script and takes most of the page. The importance of the main text is highlighted by this layout, in my opinion. It stands at the very center and in the foreground of the manuscript pages. This is typical for medieval student manuscripts as the reading of our authoritative text was the very core of university lectures. Thus, this text written by an esteemed author was more important than the master's explanation and the student notes. That relation is represented in the layout. The glosses between the lines are written in smaller scripts, mainly comprise short lexical or grammatical information and rarely, rarely longer explanation or even sentences. Their content helps to understand the main text. There are, in my opinion, mnemonic devices noted by the students during the lectures to understand the textbook at a later reading. Their specific purpose did not require elaborated explanation, but noting down single words apparently sufficed. The glosses on the page margins, however, written in similar script as the notes between the lines, um, consist mainly of whole sentences. More examples for the stylistic rules in the main text are given here. Although the master probably dictated most of these examples, there was the opportunity for students to write down own ideas during the lectures, as Johannes Stiefmeister's gloss shows, and he was able to, in my opinion, to write his um, you know, his own experience into the textbook in classical Latin. These notes illustrate, in my opinion, how late medieval university teaching related to the daily life of the masters and students, and that the students were able to make use of the knowledge and skills taught at the lectures. This knowledge was stored in manuscript codices, which made it available and movable. While preparing for exams, writing text at the texts at the university, or in later work life as a scribe or something similar, the owner of the codices were able to retrieve the stored knowledge and use it in other contexts. Furthermore, the manuscripts could be sold to other individuals or could be given to institutions. This leads to the final question, how these codices were passed down to us. The majority of late medieval student manuscripts that are available today were held at monastery or priory libraries before. When an individual student became a member of a monastery or priory, he had to give up all his worldly possession to the institution. The former Ingolstadt student Leonard Estermann, for example, gave 21 incunabula and 15 manuscript codexes to the library of the Bavarian monastery Tegernsee in 1491. In an institutional library, the chance of preserving such manuscripts was much higher than in any other context. Nevertheless, um, I looked at all his manuscripts and I had uh, got the impression that no one ever looked at it um, after 1491 um, before it was uh, retrieved then in the 19th century. They were probably not used in Tegernsee um, in the early modern period. Two codices mentioned before, the two codices mentioned before were passed down by the monasteries St. Ulrich in Afra in Augsburg and St. Amaran in Regensburg. Most of the late medieval student manuscripts available today in Germany are held at state libraries because during the secularization in the beginning of the 19th century, the codices of monasteries and prior, priory libraries were either destroyed or taken over by the emerging territorial state. University library, in contrast, rarely possess any pre-modern student manuscripts, uh, at least in Germany. They mainly collected the codices of the medieval faculty libraries and the teaching staff. 
This situation of the manuscript tradition leave us, leaves us with a corpus that is certainly not representative for the entirety of text written and used at the University of Ingolstadt in the second half of the 15th century. The still existing student manuscript codices, however, give us an idea on how knowledge, how knowledge was taught, stored and used at the late medieval University of Ingolstadt. They give us today unique insights into the medieval lecture hall. These manuscripts are an extremely valuable source, but their identification and analysis requires a lot of skill and work, but you all certainly know this. For me, thinking systematically about the interrelation of content and form in these manuscripts open up some new perspective um, on this particular material text culture of the late medieval university. Therefore, I suggest to include this perspective of layout and positioning of the different parts um, of student manuscripts into our attempt to systematically study student notes. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Maximilian, for that uh, great last talk of the day. I especially liked your uh, last assessment of, of also how the, the notes uh, actually came about until now. It's very illuminating to hear how uh, the library system worked uh, or still works in Germany throughout the ages. And I already see that there are uh, a few questions. Uh, uh, and Blair, please. Thank you so much. That's uh, exactly that ending note I'd like to pick up on. So how what is the bias of the method of transmission? And can we talk at all about all that stuff we're missing? So uh, as I take it, it's mainly people who went into religious orders. Mm -hmm. Does that tell us, I mean, did they tend to study a certain curriculum? They did theology. Um, but how, how can we try to rebuild from the, for the missing items? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a question I've been asking myself for a long time, and I have no uh, answer for that. Um, I think it's um, rather by chance if we get these codices or not, because uh, we have a rise in monasticism in um, 15th century Germany, and um, very few people, I think, uh, who went to the library, uh, to the monasteries after their um, study um, actually planned this as they started their studies. And um, Leonard Estermann, for example, with his huge uh, library collection, that is a huge collection of books, he started, in my opinion, to study um, law at um, Ingolstadt, then changed his interest to the arts and um, mainly bought books on the arts and not so much on and or a distinct feature of all of these qualities is that they don't collect any Aristotle or philosophical um, texts, so mainly rhetoric, grammar, and arithmetic. Um, and I think that in, these are the things they are interest in, interested in because they are of worth in a um, non-academic work life after they leave the university. And um, similar um, um, findings have been made for the arts faculty of the University of Vienna. Um, so it seems um, these are people who are not planning to obtain a degree. Um, they go to the university for some semesters to acquire some skill and knowledge um, that comes maybe comes in handy in, an, in a non-academic work environment as a scribe teacher or something like that. And um, yeah, and I think these um, texts that we get via the monasteries are chance by chance given to us. And um, I don't see a too strong bias. That's good news, actually, maybe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Mark. You're still muted, Mark. There we go. So uh, I just have a quick question, uh, whether in the material that you studied, uh, do you see any signs of quality control, any signs of a, uh, mm. a cooperation between the professor and the student? No, I don't see any um, signs of control. And uh, this, 
Um, this um, Regensburg manuscript is rather messy. Um, the Leonard Estermann is more, yeah, uh, contains much lesser notes, um, but I was not able, was not even able um, to identify or to find two copies who attended the same lecture um, from the 20 um, manuscripts copies I found from the Eleganzele. Um, so um, I have, I don't think there was any yeah, quality control at all. And they um, distinctly, distinctively differ from the material uh, Leonard, um, what was his name from Freiburg, uh, was studying Jürgen, with the, Jürgen yeah, yeah, Jürgen Leonard uh, was studying uh, with the, um, lectures on Cicero from the University of Leipzig at the beginning of the 16th century, because there was a definite um, set of texts which was um, taught by two masters. And here we have a, a wide collection of masters um, who get this rhetoric class, which is at the very fringe of the curriculum. It's only for three weeks um, um, and at the end of the semester. So it's not uh, so much of interest for them to teach, but it is the most expensive um, to, uh, course uh, that could be taken um, when you um, break it down to a weekly level, because apparently the, yeah, the knowledge taught here was so attractive for the students that they were willing to pay more than for other um, courses. But um, there's no sign that anyone ever um, Corrected these notes. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, enough. Uh, thank you, Maximilian, for this for this nice presentation. Uh, very amusing at times with these little side notes. Uh, so one of my questions will be about this. But the first is is, is for something you said at the beginning of your uh, presentation that students are excluded from from library use. I was wondering how common this phenomenon is across uh, uh, early modern Europe or, or, or Renaissance Europe and and and. Um, Especially also what the impact is of, of this exclusion from from library use for, for note taking, because that means that your professor becomes the most easy, the easiest, the most convenient way to access knowledge, I guess. Mm -hmm. So that, that must that must have some impact. So that's that's one question I asked myself. And another question is, is about those daily life references, which at least to me, um, give, give me the, the, the best impression of, of how uh, the, 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 or, or the most um, exciting impression of what the, the, the Renaissance classroom was like. Um, um, so I was wondering about these, 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 these remarks. Are they just uh, made for fun, these notes? Or do you think it was also in part to encourage memorization or to help mm. the student process the, the materials that were being uh, taught uh, by applying them to daily situations. So those were my two questions. Mm -hmm. um, to an answer or try to answer your first question, um, this very specific thing of um, um, the libraries at um, universities in the empire, that they are, these are mainly um, libraries of the arts faculty and the uh, masters of the arts faculty are very reluctant to give anyone access to the library. And the students are never in question um, of getting access to these libraries, um, at least in the 15th century, this kind of changes in the beginning of the 16th century. And um, they are, um, because they see this as a yeah, distinct feature of their institution. As many of these masters study, study at the higher faculties while teaching at the art faculties, law, medicine, or theology, um, they have access to the books and the other ones um, studying at these um, faculties um, don't have um, the access to these books. And so this is for this um, more merit-based um, yeah, circle of people at the universities um, a distinct yeah, advantage and they want to keep this advantage for themselves and they want to keep the books 
for themselves. And even Konrad Celsus, who is a distinct humanist, he had to um, he had to get on his knees and um, really ask them to get a, a, a key to the library. And this is very restrictive um, way um, in, in which these um, keys are given to the masters or um, predominantly only masters of the arts faculty are allowed to access the um, library. And so it's, as you said, the, your master is the way to get to the books. Um, either by uh, borrowing them to the students so that they could write um, or copy the text or by this institutionalized form of dictating and copying the text before the lectures. Um, to you know, I forgot what your second question was. <laughs> At least, ah, yeah, 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 no, I remember. Um, I think um, the example of referring to the um, uh, wine is much uh, better than beer, and the University of Ingolstadt is far more better than University of Leipzig. I think that was actually a way of trying um, by the master to bring some real life into the university lecture and to spark that what we what you were uh, suggesting. Um, by the Leon, um, by the Johannes Stedmeister example, I think that was probably uh, an idea he had during the lecture, wrote it down and maybe showed it to, to his neighbor um, and they both la laughed about this. Um, we cannot really reconstruct this, but um, that is my impression from the whole thing. But um, Johannes Stedmeister has much, he adds much more references to his daily life in these um, marginal notes, um, but they mainly concern then his mother, his brother, and other people um, from his social background and not so, on, uh, I have not found no other that is as, as funny as this one I presented to you. Thanks so okay. much. Yeah, maybe just one more note uh, about uh, the libraries being open to students. Uh, I'm pretty sure that in, in Leuven at the Trilingue, uh, students were able to go to the library because there's once a very explicit note. It's, it follows a very uh, a, a terribly long digression uh, on a specific word. And at the end, the, um, the student wrote down the words of the professor and the professor must have said something uh, like the following. Uh, well, it, it took me a very long time to write all of this down and to go to the library. Uh, but I did it so you wouldn't have to do it, which implies that the library was open to the students. So that's the difference between uh, Holland or yeah, Belgium uh, or the lot of, uh, southern low countries, excuse me, and, uh, and Germany. But that's just a quick thought. Uh, I see it's already 1833 uh, here in Belgium, which means that it's unfortunately uh, time's over. I would like to thank uh, Maximilian and, of course, Domenico uh, for the two great uh, papers. I really enjoyed both of them, uh, as well as the keynote lecture, of course, and all the three lectures. Everything was great again. Um, 